Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Pathfinder presented by Payload, the leading digital media company in the space industry. My guest today is a colleague of mine, Jack Kerr, who's Payload's research director. And I have him on the show today because we're introducing a new vertical for Payload called Payload Research. And today we're gonna talk about what it is that we're doing and building, why we're building it, and we're gonna discuss two of our more recent pieces that we published under this new vertical, our Starship report and historical look back on SpaceX's 2023 financials. But before we do all that, Jack, I know you've been on the show already and people certainly know who you are, but let me turn it over to you for just a couple minutes, just to give us a quick introduction of who you are, how you got to Payload and what, you, what you're working on with us right now. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, having me on the pod. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the research director at, at Payload. I joined the team about a year ago and I've been writing for the daily newsletter along with building out this research product that we're gonna talk a lot more uh, today about. But uh, just quickly on my background, before joining Payload, I worked in uh, finance in New York for six years, financing private equity acquisitions in the aerospace market. Um, and through that, I've been covering, I was covering uh, space businesses uh, and really fell in love with the space economy. And I've always been a space nerd. Uh, so it was a good merge between uh, like my love for economics and, and space. Um, but yeah, so, so that background that background has proven to be useful in in with payload as payload really covers the business uh, and economics of space. But so I, I worked in finance for six years. I left that job and started my own space publication, where I really began to hone my writing and and reporting on the space industry. And yeah, I don't, we Mo, I don't think we've ever really talked about this, but I really just showed up to payload one day. I mean, I, I was like mission to. To like write a freelance article and uh, never really left. I mean, I was just like I to raise my hand for pretty much everything, and then uh, a year later, here we are. <laughs> yeah, no, I that that's that's that it's very very true. I actually meet and remember when we first met in Austin. I forget which what it what, where it was, but it, we were sitting in like outdoor picnic tables. Does yeah. that ring a bell? Yeah, um, yeah, it was around South. It was probably around South. South by, yeah, no, but so. I remember, and uh, you know, you, I just remember like you were super enthusiastic about the industry, and and I was like, wow, this guy really likes space. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> let's see if we can, let's see if we can get him. Um, but you're typically, I, I know, I know you're typically based in Austin. I did hear some sirens. It doesn't sound like you're in Austin right now. <laughs> it sounds like you're in yeah, New York. <laughs> I'm back, I'm back in New York for for the week. Uh, I make my my way back and forth, but uh, generally, I'm based in Austin. It's interesting. Uh, I had I had lunch today with a CEO um, in the aerospace industry who's building one of the more interesting interesting startups um, who's based here. And we were actually just talking about how there's basically no space com community in New York. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. Yeah. A, lot Launcher, it's in, a lot of it's in LA. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. A lot of it's in LA. Um, there's always like glimmers like, you know, uh, Max Hout from, from Launcher, who, who built Launcher, he was here for a little bit. I remember, I think when we were starting, really when we were starting Payload, I remember thinking like, Oh, like there's a CEO of a launch company here. Like that's interesting. Yeah. And like, of course, he yeah. ends up moving. Um, and this company yeah, as well. Did. This company as well, who we're gonna have on the pod in in the future. Another what I would call launch type business um, that you know, like you know, effectively kind of. Well, I won't say started in New York, but certainly the founders from New York. But again, this one's also moving away from New York. So New York is not where you want to build space companies. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, but that is where a lot of the uh, the finance and economics and Wall Street coverage is. Yeah, so I mean, the, the CEOs are always here because that's where, yeah. you know, because the banks are here and there's tons yeah. of obviously fundraising opportunities, um, tons of institutional investors yeah. here. But but um, yeah. anyway, moving on to um, and, and, and a, a little bit of a related topic given the audience, but, um, you know, payload research, we're super excited. Um, second week. Uh, that we're actually technically third week that we're doing the newsletter, but it's our new research and intelligence platform. Um, our first product is a research newsletter that we're going to be publishing weekly, and it'll feature one analysis piece a week um, on a specific business and industry trend or macroeconomic insight. 
And we're going to, you know, not yet, but as we kind of get our legs underneath us on the product, we're going to plan to complement these pieces with expert interviews. Um, we're already kind of doing, and I know Jack, you did a great job with this on, on, on the visual side, data-driven visuals and charts to offer readers a more comprehensive um, a view and also offer actionable insights, whether they're, you know, folks in the industry itself, working in the industry or investors. And uh, we're also going to feature in-depth research reports, which will be more on a quarterly cadence, some quarters more or so, um, like the Starship Report, which we're going to discuss today. And uh, we also plan on hosting various events throughout the year focused on harder hitting topics and more off the record discussions like our inaugural investor summit that we held um, last remember. Um, and I do want to remind everyone that this is very different from Payload's flagship newsletter, which is an editorial product. That side of the house focuses on journalism unbiased takes on the industry, um, really not meant to be opinionated. We, however, will be opinionated and our pieces will be uh, will be very specific and have very specific views on the industry. But Jack, um, let me just turn it over to you for a second and just maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, why did we go in this direction? Like, why are we building payload research um, and, you know, what's really missing in the industry? Yeah, well, I think there's, it's really, there's, there's not a ton of accessible research uh, on the industry. I mean, there's not that much Wall Street coverage of it. There's there's a lot of startups, not too many publicly traded companies. Um, and our goal is really to create an avenue for industry leaders and, and investors to be able to get analysis, get research and get data on the industry um, where there's not that much out there right now. And I think it's also important to I me, mean, you mentioned the visuals and the data-driven charts and whatnot. This is this is going to be uh, a lot of a lot of the feedback we get from readers with our flagship newsletter, our editorial team, is that it's it's easy to digest information, and we're definitely going to keep that that payload voice and keep it keep a lot of numbers and data and and charts uh, that are easy to digest, so so um, you can get kind of actionable insights uh, without being bored. <laughs> Yeah. And, and by the way, a little bit of an anecdote that we haven't talked about super um, publicly a lot, at least, is that, you know, the first the first um, URL, I should say, or domain that we bought was payloadresearch.com. That's what it was originally. Yeah. And I, I don't know, Jack, if, I, if you knew that, but uh, we were originally thinking about building a research product. That was our very first, like, mm. go ahead, like, go. And we were like, let's build, like, an analysis-focused research business um, for the industry. And Ari and I did a ton of customer calls and interviews in the very beginning. And we said, we're going to go out and, and build this thing. And then we realized no one wanted to pay for it. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. we talked to a lot of people and we're like, okay, well, there's no, there's no market. There's no, like, market in term, in the way we see it um, for this product right now. Maybe there is down the road. So it's funny, but like, pay, like re, pay, actually, if you go on www.payloadresearch.com, I think it'll still spin you back to payload space. That won't be the case forever because we're going we're gonna to now use that <laughs> URL um, eventually. But uh, no, originally we, we did go after um, this market. And I think e e right now, as you'll, as you'll notice, like, you know, we want to do accessible content. We want to have, um, you know, there's not a lot of accessible content and coverage other than, you know, if you, you know, sometimes you need to go out there and pay an arm and a leg for a research report. So we're trying to figure out a way to like, how do we kind of like democratize um, a lot of this analysis and, 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 and insight? Um, at least that's the plan for now. So I, I think the only other thing I'd add is um, outside of the actual content itself that gets delivered to, to, to the readers, uh, the other side of it is on the event side. And, you know, I think for, you know, one of the things I'd noticed, you know, when I first got into the industry is, you know, there's a lot of events, there's a lot of conferences, there's a lot of panels, there's a lot of folks going out there talking about things. But what I've, what I've noticed is, you know, a lot of the panels that at least I've witnessed, um, you know, the conferences themselves are great, but the panels themselves sometimes aren't very helpful because, you know, I think they're very, very curated. The topics and discussions and the questions are pre-rehearsed. And, you know, when you're having a dialogue, sometimes it just doesn't feel super genuine. Everyone's like folks are sort of, you know, supporting their agenda or like talking about like what their sort of company needs are. And, you know, they, they, they have a particular way that they're presenting it and it's well rehearsed. And part of what we want to do through the payload research events is we want to make sure that we figure out a way to create more genuine dialogue and have real discussions. And part of that 
can be driven by off the record, like Chatham House rules. Um, we did this for our investor summit and it was a huge success. Everyone loved it, right? The idea that like you can sit in a room and listen to, you know, very important and and and, and um, impactful CEOs and CFOs and they, having real debate, real discussion. And yeah, maybe we don't actually send them all the questions in advance. And maybe we actually put them on the spot a little bit. And we've realized that not only is that amazing for the audience, but the panelists themselves actually appreciate it. And they feel like they can actually talk about real things and say things that they normally can't say. So that's the other thing we hope to, we hope to create from all this. But, um, but for now, we do have a weekly newsletter. Uh, you can sign up um, for it um, at www.payloadspace.com slash, slash research. Um, and we'll have that link in the show notes. And uh, you can keep up to date with what we're building, how we're building, and all the different products that we're going to um, we're going to be uh, uh, publishing. So very excited for that. But today we're going to talk about, uh, well, first we're going to talk about the Starship report, which uh, we published a few weeks ago. And Jack, obviously you were huge, huge, huge help and, and reason for us getting that out. Um, but uh, I'll just give like a quick kind of overview on what it is that we hope to achieve um, through the Starship report. And I think the first you know, the first piece of it was we wanted the industry to know that, you know, we're out here and we are, we do have the capability to go out and do deep analysis and research on different topics. Um, and we wanted our inaugural kind of uh, flagship first research report on what we consider to be the most important piece of hardware being developed in our generation, at least in our opinion, which is uh, SpaceX's Starship launch vehicle. Um, and as many of you know, this is the world's largest and most powerful rocket. Um, it's an entirely reusable stainless steel rocket, uses methane and oxygen as its propellants, um, a payload bay whose volume is on par with the ISS, um, and it's uh, being designed for crewed and uncrewed mission to low Earth orbit, to the moon, um, and of course Mars eventually, which is the only goal. And uh, we wrote a 36-page uh, free, I may add, report covering an overview of the SpaceX Starship uh, vehicle specs, um, detailed summary of the flight tests, industry comps, um, um, use cases, etc. And we're not going to go through the full report today, but we do want to highlight two sections that I think listeners today would find particularly interesting. We're going to go through. I'll go through really quickly, um, you know, highlight of, of, of the implications of Starship and why it's important. And then Jack here will go through a cost analysis of the vehicle itself. So um, to kick things off, um, as far as implications go, we're just going to talk about a couple. You can read the report. We go through a number of them um, outside of the ones we'll discuss today. But um, Starship ultimately is a very significant leap forward in engineering, right? So SpaceX aims to develop a fully and rapidly reusable orbital class rocket that can be mass produced and mass produced. That's I'm going to underline that. And Jack, I know you're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, if you compare it with the Saturn V, which took us to the moon during the Apollo era, it was very effective. It was very effective. It was very reliable. But the biggest issue was, of course, affordability, which ultimately led to the discontinuation of NASA's extended missions, right? It was just too expensive to keep, continue to launch this thing. Um, and Starship um, has the potential, in our view, to catalyze very significant change in the space economy by substantially reducing launch costs. And that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg, right? Because it's not just about the launch costs. And I think the biggest thing we want to highlight is that, and, and, and one thing that I do, we don't think is being discussed enough today is how Starship is going to change mass and design constraints for the industry. So mass limitations historically um, restricted the design of mission uh, missions and systems, both on the commercial side and on the government side, which was a direct consequence of expensive launch costs, which of course is coming down. But we don't think it's come down enough to really change the like to have a real paradigm shift in engineering. Um, and of course, all of this has affected, has impacted pretty much every facet of mission design and development, from schedule to cost structures to volume um, to you know the selection of materials to labor costs, power. Thermal GNC, et cetera. Um, and I think the best example, or I would say my, my, my personal favorite example of this is the James Webb State Space Telescope, right? JWST. And if you actually look back in history, back during when, you know, this was, this was um, originally proposed in the NASA Science Directive in 97, right? The first iteration of this telescope had an eight mirror, eight meter mirror design which at the time cost roughly about $500 million, or they were estimating would be $500 million to build. And then basically from 97, 2021, it went from 500 million and went all the way to, to what eventually was $10 billion, right? So basically a 20 fold increase, 20 X increase in, 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 in launch costs. And a lot of that was because of volume constraints. 
So mostly due to launch capability. So, you know, that mirror design did not fit. So they needed to make it smaller. Um, and generally speaking, obviously in engineering, when you make things smaller, um, it increases cost and in complexity. Therefore, right. So, so in our view, Starship has the potential to disrupt that correlation between mass and cost. Um, and you know, historically, capital has been spent focused on optimizing mass to save on launch costs. Now, Starship's going to flip that equation upside down, and engineers can, engineers can now focus on the most cost effective methods of construction and development of a spacecraft um, without needing to worry about mass optimization, because every single time you send up a launch vehicle that has the capability of launching an, an, an ISS by volume, it completely changes the game, right? So in short, you know, the view is that we're going to be transitioning from an era of, of mass constraints to one of mass abundance. And so obviously Starship hasn't reached orbit yet. Um, yep. <laughs> and we do, I think there's a, there's general optimism that this year will be that year. Uh, but there's also an understanding kind of in the industry that at least the first couple years are going to be the Starship launches are going to be focused on Starlink, deploying Starlinks, the heavier, bigger Starlinks, and also the Artemis program and HLS. When do you think like customer payloads will be flown? Two. <laughs> well, uh, great question. And I know you and I debate are continuing to debate this yeah. Yeah. continuing to debate this huh um so look i think the, the, look it's very clear that the main focus main priority of starship in the very beginning is going to be starlink right because next generation of starlink version two from a mass perspective like you can't elon can't get that fast and get that up into space fast enough using falcon heavy and falcon nine just the mass doesn't the the, the mass constraints of the of the payload fairing of the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy doesn't allow for it. So they need Starship to work, right? It's sort of like, um, you know, bottom line, like they need Starship to work because that's kind of the primary and initial payload that's going to be going up into space. So um, that's going to take up a number of launches. I mean, we can do the ca calculation easily, you know, a year, maybe more than that, a year to two years before, you know, they're comfortable launching other commercial um, um, launches. Now, that being said, the question becomes, okay, well, when is Starship operational? Now, operational, in my mind, does not mean that they need to land a booster or land the thing. They just need to be able to get it up into space, right? So the question is how long until they can get it up into orbit at a regular cadence, you know, maybe I'm being optimistic, but I think that's probably by the end of this year. I think by the end of this year, I think they'll be able to comfortably get Starship up to orbit. Um, I'm yeah. definitely not. I'm definitely. I mean, do, would you disagree with that? No, I, I definitely <laughs> agree. I think it's. I think there's a good shot on the next uh, on the next launch, and it's actually this is going to be for another podcast. But there's an interesting argument to be made about a fully expendable Starship because yeah. it is like we're going to. This is a good transition into our next topic, which is yep. just on the cost analysis, but yep. uh, SpaceX has built this vehicle to be very, very inexpensive, mm. um, allowing them to build a bunch of them and uh, potential and just, ex you know, the first couple launches, just expend them and move on to the next, the next launch. Yeah. So to answer your question, I'll turn it over to you, Jack. I think that we will have a commercial, the first commercial payload on a Starship launch vehicle. I mean, here's the thing, right? I think it could be as early as 2025. And the only reason why I say that is because if we can, if, if it's operational by the end of this year, operational is defined as getting into space, getting a payload into space. Um, there's a chance that SpaceX will want to showcase the, 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 the they'll want to start to like create some type of demand for it early on. Because like, if you say, hey, we have this working vehicle, by the way, it's a two year waiting list, like, you know, we'll let you know when you're when you can book. I think that could create issues, especially if there's other competitor competitor launch vehicles that are going up and, you know, can start to capture market share. And we know that SpaceX loves to do things like the transporter mission, right? Which I mean, look, we know it's probably not very economical for SpaceX to do it, but we know why they do it. So I can also see the argument, well, hey, this is working. Let's get some commercial payloads, like non-Starling payloads up into space. So I would say if I'm being really optimistic, I think 2025, we can start seeing commercial um, non-Starling payloads. But 
maybe realistically it's towards the end of 2025, early 2026. What do you think? <laughs> I think it's it's gonna they're gonna have to focus on HLS and Artemis and oh, there you go. <laughs> there's this the, the architecture. Yeah, that is that is that is true. That is true. I think it's just gonna be there is that that architecture is just so complex that uh, starting next year, 2025, it's going to be fully, fully geared towards fulfilling that HLS contract. Um, and then, and then we'll see. I mean, it's also possible that that customer payloads primarily fly on Falcon 9, and uh, for the next number of years, uh, Starship is just is just Starlink. But I think we can. Should we move on to the uh, the cost analysis? Yeah, let's um, talk about cost. Let's let's start. Just in the interest of time, let's talk about cost because as because um, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the just as a, a reframing, the rocket building historically has been an extraordinarily costly endeavor, and entities have used teams of subcontractors that have been riddled with inefficiencies, delays, and cost overruns. And the history of SpaceX is really flipping that, taking the opposite approach of that, and vert- vertically integrating, having this kind of delete the part, deleting unnecessary parts mindset, using low cost material. And, and really running the business like it's a business with a, with a lot of uh, emphasis on cost controls. And, and I mean, to them, it's like, right, it's like they want to run it as Apple or Tesla runs their business where they make a really awesome premium product, but also really focus on bringing down costs to manufacturer to actually to manufacture the product to make a profit and return capital to, to shareholders. So that is that is what SpaceX has done with Falcon 9, and they are further refining this manufacturing, uh, this you know, attentiveness to cost manufacturing process with Starship. And our analysis, so we we put together this analysis of what it costs to build one Starship. That's the super heavy booster plus the Starship second stage. And our estimate is that it costs ninety million dollars to build one Starship. Not and taking into cap- account. Not taking into account R and D, obviously. Like not, there are so many caveats mm-hmm. to this. That <laughs> okay, really, go. I'll say, let you caveat it. I'll let you caveat I would, it. <laughs> I would say it's the best way to think of it. This is this is how uh, this this is how um, you should think about. Uh, this is how we are thinking about how to build Starship. SpaceX is going to spend ten billion dollars on R and D to build Starship. So this is kind of like a, a forward looking uh, model. And there's also a lot of dynamics that can that can bring the cost lower as as manufacturing builds and Raptor engine price decreases. And we, we also this is this is our estimate based off data and our sources and um, publicly information publicly available information. It's not based off SpaceX's data that they gave us. So basically, our build to a ninety million dollar vehicle really starts with the Raptor engines. There's thirty nine Raptor engines, and we estimate each Raptor engine costs one million dollars, and that ends up being the big bucket uh, to build Starship. Is just these engines. You have a ton, a ton of engines. They're they're now building about an engine a day, which is, or they have been, I should say, for the last year or so, building an engine a day, um, and ramping up manufacturing build rate, which which uh, we expect and SpaceX expects to build that to reduce the cost per engine going forward. But right now we're, we're estimating that to be to be one million dollars, which is still a very inexpensive engine uh, compared to, to how big it is and, and competitors. Uh, another big bucket is is just labor. I mean, this thing is you can think it's a, it's a 400 foot tin can, essentially. You have you have like stainless steel and a bunch of air inside of it, uh, and that stainless steel material was a big cost uh, reduction that SpaceX moved fr- moved to uh, compared to Falcon Nine, which was using this aluminum and carbon fiber material. Um, but regardless of how you cut it, whether you use low cost material, whether you're using better avionics, it's still a massive, massive structure that needs to be built. Uh, and SpaceX is employing about 2,000 people at, at Starbase uh, to build that structure. And they're, they're probably in the next 12 to 18 months, we'll be able to hit a, a manufacturing rate of about five of these full stack uh, Starships a year. Um, and we estimate that the labor per Starship will be around $35 million. So that, that, la- that Raptor engine plus the labor are the two big buckets to think about in building Starship. By the way, before you continue, I just want to say something, which is like, it is 
really interesting to me that every single time Starship launches and, you know, you know, they, they, they hit a new milestone and obviously the vehicle um, um, blows up, for lack of a better word. It's always like, yeah, Elon's like, yeah, I got three more in the bay. <laughs> He's like, they yeah. just like pop out a new one. <laughs> and I'm always yeah. like, I'm always just like, it's just like amazing that they're just like, you know, two months later, they're like, all right, here's a new starship getting ready. So, you know, I, I like it's, it's, I, I say that a little tongue in cheek, but it is actually really remarkable even right now. Right. Even before they're getting everything, all the manufacturing and the supply, the supply chain side of things like really humming. Like it's actually pretty incredible how quickly they're like spinning out new ones to get to the launch. Yeah, pad. definitely. Definitely. Uh, okay, so uh, Raptor engines, majority of the cost makes sense. Labor, number two, because of course, you know, at the end of the day, it is just like you mentioned, like, you know, a tin can, it is, main, you know, a lot of stainless steel. What else is, maybe at a high level, what else is driving that cost to the 90 million? Well, it, the move to stainless steel is an important factor here. I mean, it's, it's cool to see, they're literally trucking in coils of stainless steel and they're able to build, basically Starship is built based off rings of stainless steel that are appended together to make a big object. Uh, and that way of manufacturing is very efficient compared to, you know, higher scrap rates with other, with other materials. So, so that, that's driving it uh, as well. But I think looking forward, SpaceX is, is looking to bring the cost to build, to build Starship down even further. Mm-hmm. And the, the important thing to look at here is not the booster but really the second stage starship so so when starship is launched you have the you have the booster and the second stage it goes up mm-hmm. the booster is separated and then within minutes returns is is supposed to return back to the launch pad uh to then be refurbished and used again in a certain amount of time uh whereas the second stage goes off and completes a mission and that mission could be deploying payloads in orbit for, and it might take a couple days for it to then return. It's a fully usable, reusable rocket. So it, it, it is supposed to return and land back at, at Starbase, but it might take a couple days. It could go off to the moon where it might take a couple months or it could go to Mars where it could never, you know, there's the, the second stage is going to have to be built at a much higher order of magnitude than the booster. So the way the way to look at it is is what is you know at, when they can get fully operational, what is that second stage cost to build, uh, and they're going to look to mass produce that second stage, and they're going to look to 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 be able to pump one out maybe once a week, so maybe fifty a year of just building these rockets, these second stage spacecraft rockets, and that they, they have a they have a a kind of assembly line factory that's being being built called Star Factory that will will produce these and reduce costs even further as you can spread labor costs and, and get more efficiency out of it. Jack, on a side note, I know you had a chance to visit Starbase and I think you might be the only person at the company so far that's visited Starbase. What was that like? Well, that's the advantage of living in Texas. But I think we should, I, th- I do think we should do for next, uh, our p- next payload offsite, have everyone get, go down to Starbase because it's really, really cool you can literally, like the night before, you can get within 150 yards of Starship and like see it. And people are just hanging out there. It's a bunch of nerds just hanging out. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's a really cool experience. And yeah. um, and also, like the yeah, when it's launched, it's a it's a noise and power that hits you from four miles away where you're standing, uh, like I've never felt before. And there's, no. it's not, you know, there's, there's also like, there's also, I want to see a Vulcan launch. Mm-hmm. I want to go see a, 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 a new Glenn launch too. There's a lot of cool rockets being uh, developed and launched this year and, and next year. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. And I, and I, I love the idea. I mean, what it's, it's, it, it, I actually had a friend who went down, who is not in the industry. She's more of an investor who really hasn't, invested in space outside of an investment into spacex who who got a chance to go down to starbase for the uh second uh integrated flight test and she was absolutely blown away she was just like i've never felt more inspired than being there and seeing all this not only seeing the the launch itself but being around all the all those people um both engineers of the company but also just enthusiasts and just people in the industry so um i I think that's i think that's a great idea so so for everyone listening huge endorsement from jack 
uh, to go to Starbase. Uh, but in the interest of time, um, we do need to move on from Starship. If you want to find out more, read more, you're going to have to read the full report, which if you are, haven't already done so, you can find at www.payloadspace.com slash Starship dash report. And uh, uh, I, I would very much say, um, and I think Jack would agree that this is really our first publication around Starship. There's no question that as we learn more, you know, obviously SpaceX doesn't like to say a lot about this. So most of what we gather is from our, our sleuthing online. But um, as we as there's more information, as there's more data around Starship, and as we get a better understanding of timelines, and, you know, both on the development side and launch timelines, we're going to continue to publish more and more about um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the vehicle. So um, stay tuned. Now, moving on, last week, we published a piece on SpaceX. And uh, it was not the first time we did so, um, specifically on its financials. And uh, in fact, um, the very first time we did, it was actually one of the most read articles that we've ever published. Um, so it was an estimate on SpaceX's 2022 and 2023 financials. Um, at the time when we first published the piece, we estimated that the SpaceX, and by the way, I need to, I need to caveat like a hundred times over, we did not have any proprietary information. We did not speak to anyone at SpaceX. We did not use any information that was not publicly available and just our own kind of internal models. Um, but at the time we estimated that SpaceX's 2022 revenue was gonna come in around 4.597 billion, which came in at about 3 million um, of the Wall Street Journal um, reported actual revenue of 4.6 billion. So we were very proud of getting very close to that $4.6 billion number. Um, that is great. That is crazy. I, that is, <laughs> that's, not, that's not three with a B. That's three with an F. Three million yeah, that was, is like rounding hair. That was, that was, that was great. That was great. Uh, yeah. And I think we published that original report um, in, uh, I think it was like fall of 2022. So it was obviously, well, it was a year before yeah. the journal came out with the actual number. But... Our original 2023 estimate was a little off. So we had clocked in that um, estimate at the time, which around 11 billion, which was 20% off of our newest estimate, which was 8.7 billion for 2023, which is also backing into, um, you know, the Bloomberg reported $9 billion internal projection by SpaceX. So once we got that new number, we kind of worked backwards to say, okay, well, how do we, you know, SpaceX doesn't break down that number. We don't know what's associated with what, and we don't know how revenue is attributed. So, you know, we, we, we gave it our best shot in terms of like, how do we, you know, back into like what that number is. Yeah. But we do, we do know a lot of information. We know pricing. We know, yeah. we know how many launches. These are very public yeah. things. We know how many launches yeah. are launched. We know how we know NASA contracts, public, we have public data on space for contracts, space force contracts, and, uh, we know what the Starlink pricing is. So there is a way of getting really, really granular about it and um, and coming to what should be a pretty decent number. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, And look, at the end of the day, this is our best guess. You know, we're not trying to, you know, we're not, look, we were, I guess both of us are former Wall Street analysts, but ultimately, you know, the point of this is to really create debate and discussion, right? Ultimately, and we want people to, and, and trust me when I say this, plenty of people disagree with us. Um, and it's always great to see and it makes us better. So if, if, if after hearing all this or reading all this, if you yourself have any insight or ideas as to, you know, what might be off about the way we're calculating things, obviously, please reach out and let us know. But um, just to go through the assumptions really quickly. Um, so for launch, I'll just cover launch real quickly. Um, in, in 2023, SpaceX prioritized Starlink um, over customer launches, which ultimately resulted in a lower revenue than, than, than our original, original guess. Launch revenue came in about $1.8 billion below our original forecast, and that was um, driven by fewer than expected commercial Falcon 9 launches. Um, and there were two crewed missions that were pushed out to 2024. Um, we also um, revised down Starlink revenue by about $1.3 billion. Um, but, you know, Jack, I'll let you talk about that in just a second. Um, but as far as customer versus um, Starlink dedicated launches, we originally estimated that uh, you, your kind of com standard commercial Falcon 9 la launches would be about 30, um, which was not the case. Falcon 9 um, commercial missions were flat year over year. 
Um, and overall, SpaceX ended up launching about 63 Starlink dedicated, um, not about, excuse me, exactly 63 Starlink dedicated Falcon 9 missions in 23, which of course resulted in zero revenue for the company. Um, they launched 12 standard commercial missions at about 65, 67 million apiece, which is our estimate. Four transporter missions at 45 million, um, four, 45 million each. Three crewed missions at about 260 million a mission. Three commercial resupply missions at about 145 million each. Six government Falcon 9 missions at about 100 million each. And then five Falcon Heavy missions between 130 and 150 million, which got us to a, um, to a, to a launch revenue of about three and a half billion. So that's a total of 96 launches, uh, roughly two, a little short of two a week, um, but sadly four short of Elon's 100 launch goal. He was so close. But uh, on to Starlink. So Jack. Uh, over to you. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that launch dynamic that they are launching, that they launched way more Starlink dedicated uh, missions last year than standard commercial and, and you know, partnering with another SATCOM provider and launching their satellites. It really goes to show that it was, it was like their focus on Starlink is, takes precedent. Like even, maybe even more precedent than, than Starship. Because it is, it was, 2023 was the year of Starlink. It was, focused on their, they want to focus on growth. They want to focus on increased capacity, sending more satellites to space and um, getting better down, down load speeds. Mm-hmm. Um, but last year, SpaceX reported that they ended the year at 2.3 million active customers. Uh, and that's, that's an increase of 1.3 million users uh, during that year. And the growth, the growth was driven by a bunch of different factors, but you have, it's, it's a new, it's a new business. I mean, people forget that this only started a couple of years ago in like 2019, 2020. So uh, the growth really was driven by uh, increased brand recognition. And you had this capacity uh, improvement that, that we mentioned before, and also growth in international markets. I mean, Starlink has really become an, an international business where 40% of the users come from outside the U.S. Uh, and that number is going to, you know, next year that number is going to, could hit 50% and they could surpass the U.S. Uh, user base in, in a couple of years. So they've done a really good job of, of driving and growing that customer, bit, customer base. Um, and in our, in our assumptions, we're estimating that uh, this, the average uh, price per user uh, for Starlink, for residential Starlink as a consumer product, would be is uh, like a, about one hundred and five dollars a month, uh, and that's kind of blending down because global uh, pricing is a little bit lower than than U.S. pricing. Actually, interestingly, next they in the last couple months they've reduced Europe pricing, Starlink Europe pricing dramatically by like 40 percent. Where now in in France you can get a Starlink subscription for like 45 bucks a month. Um, but that came later in the year. So, so we're still assuming a higher uh, a price on that. Uh, Maritime, the Starlink on, on boats grew tremendously last year. They're now at 10,000 users, which is much higher than we expected. Uh, and then aviation is interesting. Aviation, they only have 80 aircrafts. They only have Starlink installed on 80 aircrafts. Um, and which I think just goes to show you that there's this longer sales cycle with aviation. They have 400 uh, contracts out right now, but it just takes longer to install these things and, and get it up and running on, on aviation. That can be a, a big growth area in the next couple of years. So in total, Starlink revenue grew from 1.9 uh, billion in 2022 to 4.2 billion in, in 2023. They also reached uh, cash flow break even, which is an important milestone for the for the uh, division, um, and it's also a significant milestone because uh, it was the year that SpaceX generated more revenue from their satellites than they did from launch, which which makes them a satellite business possibly. <laughs> um, so they they yeah you know another another very interesting thing that we were surprised by this year was how strong the consumer market was for Starlink. Because we were estimating that business, that enterprise fixed business would be like 15, 20% of the Starlink business. And that that's based off of their competitors, Hughes Network or, or Viasat data. But only 2.6% 
of their users are these fixed site businesses. And it, it just goes to show you that they're really that Starlink at the onset is really a consumer product through and through. And I think next year they're going to really begin to focus on that enterprise uh, offering as well. Yeah, my guess is Starlink at scale, SpaceX is really targeting, at least over the next 10 years, probably my guess is somewhere in the order of 50 to 100 million Starlink users. I think that's what they, that's, I think that's what they really need to get to for it to throw off cash flow for them to do like interplanetary work. Um, which of course is the main, which is the main goal. Should we talk really quickly about other? <laughs> there is a, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, a uh, category that we've lumped yeah. in as other, which is yeah. parts of the business that we can't fit in anywhere else. <laughs> but makes up a pretty sizable part of the business. You have this HLS contract, so that's the human landing vehicle that uh, will bring humans back to Mars. Excuse me, back to the back to the moon uh, through the Artemis program. And that is SpaceX is generating generating about uh, seven hundred fifty million dollars a year via NASA contracts to build um, to build that vehicle. There's also a couple uh, government dollars that are earmarked that were earmarked for Falcon Falcon Heavy infrastructure and uh, satellite build that that kind of rounded out uh, this other bucket um, in our in our calculation. Yeah. So um, really, uh, in conclusion, just in, in the interest of time, in conclusion, you know, um, like Jack mentioned, 2023 was the year of Starlink. And the focus for the company, of course, was growing both the user base and, of course, the satellite constellation itself. Um, and, you know, for now, it's definitely paid off, right? The company has hit cash flow break even, key milestone for the business. They're prepping. It, well, I, was, I should say there's a lot of back and forth about this, but everyone's prep. Everyone's hoping and 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 trying to predict when that IPO is going to be, or um, what I would say is uh, IPO of Starlink to be very specific. Um, there was some original discussion uh, last year that it would be sometime later this year. We don't think that. I think fundamentally, we think it's probably more of a 2025 milestone for the company. But obviously, you know that's that's coming around the corner. Um, but in general, so launch revenue grew from uh, about 2.4 billion in 2022 to three and a half billion in 23. Starlink revenue grew from 1.9 to 4.2, um, and uh, you know they launched 63 missions for Starlink specifically, um, and also introduced their higher capacity V2 minis. Um, so, which has uh, much much more improved capacity and download speeds. Um, and geographically, they're now available in 70 plus countries um, and everywhere in the U.S. So, um, you know, it's our thinking now that the company is no longer constrained by user terminal uh, manufacturing capabilities. So, so anyway, overall, great year for the company. Um, and uh, we do want to remind everyone again that um, most of these numbers are our uh, internal estimates, especially the breakdowns between them. Um, we feel good about them, but at the same time, um, you know, we don't have, again, access to proprietary information. And uh, look, ultimately, we want to do this because no one else is. No one else in the industry is coming out doing this. Um, and, you know, it's obvious why, because it's, really hard and requires a ton of assumptions, um, some of which aren't always going to be correct. But, um, you know, it's doing what we want it to do and what we can see happening online, which is it's creating discussion and it's driving debate, um, which gets me to what's next. Um, we're going to do it again. So in a couple of days, we're going to be publishing in our next payload research newsletter, we're going to be predicting SpaceX's 2024 revenue. <laughs> And we're going to see how close we get. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're working on that now, putting the final touches, but that should be in your inbox in the next couple of days. I don't know, Jack, if you wanted to add anything to that. <laughs> yeah, all this, this is all online. So you can see the breakdown of it. Sign up, sign up for a newsletter. You can see the, the breakdown of where the, uh, the revenue buckets are coming from. And, and you can cross compare and let us know how we did. Awesome. Now, uh, just as we wrap up here, uh, two final questions. The first for you, Jack, is maybe talk a little bit about what people should expect from future payload research editions. Well, we have like a, we have a ton of interesting topics that are that are uh, on our content calendar, and these are topics that will that will be related to headlines, uh, but go beyond beyond headlines and really dissect uh, a certain uh, story or, or industry trend. So we have one one uh, topic I'm really excited about is uh, ULA is going through a sale process, 
So we're going to do a, a deep dive into uh, what we think the valuation of ULA would be, um, who are the buyers around this, uh, what are the financials, how are buyers looking at this, um, how do you value a rocket business uh, that's not named SpaceX. Um, we have, yeah, we have uh, cash burn, cash burn for publicly traded companies. There's a lot of uh, publicly traded SPAC space businesses that are running out of cash. And um, we're going to do analysis on that. Uh, there is there is a lot, there's a lot of interesting uh, topics coming up um, that we will, we will tell in, in digestible ways. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we're uh, um, obviously very, very excited to, to, um, reveal all that to you. So, um, keep, uh, stay tuned is what I should say. Um, and then, uh, final question for you, Jack is, um, what are you looking forward to covering the most this year? I know you're still working with the editorial team. Um, any news stories, um, news stories or anything on the research side that you're particularly looking at diving into or breaking down? It's going to be a really interesting year for the, uh, satellite communication market. I- I'm very curious how, what, what the market size is for, for uh, satellite internet providers. Is there mm-hmm. enough room for a Kuiper to exist plus a uh, Starlink to exist plus the five or six other uh, Constellation uh, satellite providers that are out there? And I think it's, it's going to be a big year. It's going to be an interesting uh, trend to, to keep an eye out for and, and try to market size. Um, I think all these... I mean, we ha- there is there is a certain inflection point we we're at right now with with uh, next gen rockets launching this year, and there's a lot of really really impressive, interesting, and what will be uh, impactful uh, rockets that come on the market that are not named Starship. And getting into those is going to be really fascinating, um, and and seeing those progress as well. Yeah, no, it's going to be a very exciting year, to say the least, and a big year for the moon. There's lots of moon landings coming up, so yeah. we're, we're, we're excited to see how those pan out. But, um, yeah. but uh, yeah, so just the, the final thing I'll say is um, if you, as the listener, um, have ideas that you want to see us covering, please let us know. Please reach out. You can uh, email myself and Jack, which is just mo at payloadspace.com and jack at payloadspace.com. Very easy. Um, but let us know what you want us to be covering if there's any topics ideas that you think need a little bit more analysis more insight more more time spent on um, please do let us know and jack thank you for uh, being on the show and we're going to do a lot more of these so stay tuned and um, a lot more coming from payload research so thanks guys um, and until next time we will see you soon